the ESP32 is a beast with some secrets. Today we will look at its pins and create a priority pin list, which saves you a lot of time and hassle. Grüezi YouTubers, here is the guy with the Swiss accent, with a new episode and fresh ideas around sensors and microcontrollers. Remember, if you subscribe, you will always sit in the first row. In this video, we will get an overview of all pins of the ESP32. Learn which pins have particular purposes and therefore have to be treated with care. Learn the real universally usable pins. Create a strategy on how to use the many pins for our projects. And do some programming examples. The most important source of wisdom for parts always is the datasheet. If we consult the ESP32 datasheet, it looks like the chip has 40 GPIO pins, numbered from GPIO0 to GPIO39. GPIO, by the way, means General Purpose Input Output Pins. I copied this overview sheet into Excel. Like that, we can filter and sort it as we wish. Of course, you find a link to it in the description. If we have a close look, we see that only 32 pins are labeled GPIO. GPIO 20, 24, 28 through 31, 37 and 38 do not exist. Please don't ask me why. But still, 32 is a lot compared with the ESP8266 or the Arduino Uno. The next surprise. Not all those pins are general purpose, as the name implies. GPIO 34 through 39 should be called GPI pins. They cannot be used as output pins. Mostly 34 and 35 are dangerous, if you do not pay attention and try to use them for output. No warning will pop up and, after hours, you think you are stupid. GPIO 36 and 39 usually are labeled as Sensor VP and Sensor VN. We will later see that they have a special function. So there are 28 true GPIO pins left. ESP32 modules like the VROOM or the VROVER use an external flash memory chip to store data. So GPIO 6 to 11 are connected to this flash chip and are forbidden for us unless you exactly know what you do. Still, 22 potentially true GPIO pins are left. Next are the so-called strapping pins. They have a function during boot up and, if wrongly connected, prevent your ESP32 from booting. GPIO 0 is well known to us. Sometimes we have to press a boot button, which tells the chip that we want to flash a new firmware. Definitely not a general purpose pin. We should not use it unless we absolutely need it. And then make sure it is always high during boot. GPIO2 also has a hidden function. If you pull it high during boot, you are not able to flash new content. Also here, you will search for the error for a long time. GPIO5 also seems to have a function, but I did not see a disadvantage by pulling it low or high, other than the MTDO or GPIO15. If you pull this pin low, the ESP32 does not show the log anymore at boot up. If you do not know it, you probably will search for a problem, which in reality is none. GPIO0 and GPIO2 should not be used for projects without need. 20 pins are left. Most development boards use RXTX for flashing and debugging. These are GPIO1 and 3. We should not touch them too. 18 pins left. Often we need an I2C interface. The ESP32 has two such interfaces because we can attach up to 112 sensors to one connection, we usually only need one. The standard pins are GPIO 21, 22. 
and can be changed with this command to most other GPIO pins. For displays, for example, the fast SPI interface is the right choice. The ESP32 has two usable SPI interfaces that use the following pins. The third SPI bus is used for the flash memory chip, by the way. Standard libraries use the VSPI pins, as shown in the SPI example sketch. Because many sensors offer an I2C interface, I usually do not use these two pins for other purposes. 16 pins left. If you plan to debug your sketch using the inline debugger of Platform IO, you have to spare GPIO 12 to 15 out for your project. 12 pins left. This is my priority one pins list. I always start to use these pins. Only on PCB layouts, it might be handy to use other pins. Or if you really need a lot of pins, then you can use the flexibility of the ESP32 to change pins for functions like I2C, Serial or SPI. Next, we have a look at the secondary function of pins. For example, the datasheet shows us many ADC pins. Unfortunately, all pins starting with ADC2 cannot be used if we use Wi-Fi. And who is not using Wi-Fi with the ESP32? A good thing, GPIO 34 through 39 can be used as ADC input pins. My preferred solution to relieve my priority one pin list. Just keep in mind, the ESP32 ADC results are not excellent as shown in video number 340, but good enough to measure battery voltage, for example. You can easily add two resistors and monitor a 4.2 volts Li-Yon battery. The ESP32 also has two 8-bit DAC outputs on GPIO 25 and 26. They are very simple to program. Just use this command and the results are OK as we see here. We can also create sine waves, for example, with this function. Next comes PWM. In this mode, pins generate a square wave signal with a variable on-off ratio. Such signals are used to control servos, for example, or dim LEDs. Fortunately, we can use all GPIOs for PWM. Just a curiosity, the ESP32 never got the same implementation as the Arduino where analog write is used. Also, not the best choice if you ask me. But the ESP32 implementation is even more adventurous. It seems that somebody wrote a function to dim LEDs and then it stayed like that. First, we have to define the frequency and the resolution of a channel. Then we have to attach this channel to a pin. After that, we can start to write to this channel. As we see here, the ESP32 can create relatively high frequencies, which might be interesting for some projects. Anyway, these were the typical usages of GPIO pins in projects with one exception, interrupts. Interrupts are a great functionality of most MCUs. We can interrupt any running sketch with an external signal, which can drastically simplify some sketches. As we saw in video number 328, the ESP32 is not very fast in this discipline, but we can use all pins for that purpose. Very flexible. If you never used it, I strongly suggest trying interrupts at least once. If we want to use an interrupt pin to wake the ESP32 from deep sleep, we have to use so-called RTC GPIO pins. Here we see, like with the ADCs, that we can use GPIO 34 through 39 to save our priority one pins. Now we definitely come to the exotic usages of pins. The first being touch sensors. 10 pins can be used for that purpose. If we exclude the special pins, we still get 8 pins. So far, I had no projects with them. I only played around. Maybe you know of cool projects using these pins? 
And the last, even more exotic function is a hole sensor. Here I have no idea why it is built in. Definitely a solution on the search for a problem. Because even strong magnets do not influence the hole sensor over distance. So I prefer to use such a small hole sensor chip that can be mounted where the action is and keep the ESP32 away in a safe case. Just in case you want to use this hole sensor, it is connected to GPIO 36 and 39. You must leave these pins open if you want to use the sensor. That's it. The last remaining question is, how do I choose the pins? I start with my priority one list. If I expect that they will not be sufficient, I use the GPI pins for analog input or wake up. I try to stick with the standard I2C or SPI pins as some libraries do not allow to change pins. Especially libraries coming from the Arduino only use wire begin, which use standard pins. Only in rare cases I switch standard pins. For example, if I need three serial connections. Standard serial 1 pins are mapped to pins used by the flash chips. If I design PCBs, I sometimes use the flexibility of changing pins to ease the design. Those are my two cents. I'm sure you have a lot to add in the comments. As always, you find all the relevant links in the description. I hope this video was useful or at least interesting for you. If true, please consider supporting the channel to secure its future existence. Thank you. Bye.